this time on Psychic Investigators. A young mother vanishes. Send me a sign. Where are you? And the police can't find her. No leads came. Nothing. Until a psychic tunes into her spirit. Little blips of things that were coming through. And claims to see what no one else can. Could feel her getting dizzy, heart fluttering. But aren't his visions too late? I didn't feel she was alive. Is the damage already done? Wasn't adding up. People involved, they got away with something. She was a good mother. I thought, oh, she's going to be asking me to babysit all the time. And I was just out of all that stuff. And I only had one child, and I didn't want to get back into that. And she didn't. Maybe once a month, you know, she'd ask me to babysit. And always after Dylan was already sleeping at night. But when Nicole fails to return home that night, her parents know something is very wrong. Recently, Nicole has been hanging out with a bad crowd with a taste for booze and drugs. I knew that if she didn't come home and didn't let us know something was wrong, that she couldn't. The next morning, Nicole's father, Jerry, now deceased, heads straight to the Sayreville police to file a missing persons report. Detective Jim Novak is put in charge of the case. Parents know if something's really wrong with their child. I said, what do you think? Mr. Rokas came out and said that I think she's dead. Before you suspect foul play, you try and rule out all of the other common things that normally you find in a missing person's case, especially an adult. There's really no crime to be a missing person. A description of Nicole and her vehicle, a black 1980 Chevy Malibu, are fed into the National Crime Information Computer System to see if any other police department in the United States ever had contact with that license plate. And there was no one that ran her license plate or her car wasn't found somewhere and run by the police. Jerry Arocas gives Detective Novak details about his daughter. She didn't like to drive her own car, especially at night. And he wasn't too fond of her choice of friends. He didn't particularly care for her boyfriend, Michael Reed. Detective Novak knows Mike Reed. Reed is a suspect in a recent string of car burglaries. I always thought he was the best liar I've ever met. He would, he would lie to me and smile as he did it. It was, it was almost like Charles Manson type thing. But her father's biggest fear is that his daughter's recent drug habit, heroin, might have something to do with her disappearance. Detectives start by interviewing some of Nicole's friends, Eric Nordling, Todd Connors, and Mike Reed. Detectives went into the house to check the house for Nicole. Other detectives interviewed the three occupants, uh, Eric, Todd, and Michael. And everyone denied having any further contact other than seeing Nicole leave that night to go what they called out to several bars to do some drinking. As we were leaving, Michael called to me. He said, uh, Mr. Novak, I want you to know, I didn't love Nicole. We were only friends. I looked at Detective Sergeant Sprague, and simultaneously, we said to each other, she's dead. And the reason we felt that way is because he used the past tense, and there was no reason at this point to think of Nicole as anything else than in the present, unless there was. But what? There's no evidence to back up a feeling. They continue to pursue the missing persons case, contacting local hospitals, 
checking towing reports, and connecting with state police. Two days go by, and there is no sign of Nicole or her car. At this point in the investigation, we had no leads. Once you don't come home for a number of days and no one hears from you for a number of days, now this person is really maybe not a, uh, just a missing person on their own account, but maybe in fact some kind of foul play may have occurred here. I would go out on the back porch every night and just look around and say, just send me a sign, something. Where are you? I know you're out here somewhere. Desperate for any answers, the family is willing to try anything. My uncle, Walt Werner, worked for the Hackensack Police Department, and he suggested a psychic that the police force sometimes used. Frank St. James lives in New Jersey and has a reputation for finding missing persons. I'm like a human satellite or something, going anywhere. Little blips of things I could draw in, get real close. Sometimes they come really quick in flashes. It's like looking through their eyes. But his one rule, no immediate family members in the session. Diane Macaluso, Pat Arokas's best friend, goes in her place. My husband and I uh, took a, a tape recorder with us to record the session, and we took a picture of Nicole with us. And what the picture shows him, no one really wants to hear. I tell you, I don't have a good feeling about it. It did expire sometime Sunday morning. Single mother Nicola Rogas of Sayreville, New Jersey has been missing for three days. Psychic Frank St. James says she's dead. She did expire sometime Sunday morning. Oh, my heart sank when I heard that because I was still hoping that maybe she just went off with friends. The psychic claims to be picking up images of Nicole from the night she went out with friends. I pick up some drugs Saturday. The turnpike is off of there on one of those little side roads. She's not moved. Not too far from home. Um, I do feel something by Thursday. Is the psychic right? Will they find Nicole by Thursday? I didn't have hope that she was alive. I knew that when she didn't contact us and didn't come home, I knew it. But I just had to find her. The Orocas invite the psychic to their home. Maybe here, he can get a clearer picture of where their daughter might be. Left alone, he moves through the house. It's in the kitchen where Frank claims to connect with Nicole's spirit. Nicole started to come through really easy. It looked like I was flying up above near water a dirt road, bridges, cattails, or her car in the marsh. One of the wheels was in the water, a feeling of closed in. I felt that if I was standing 25 feet away from where she was, I wouldn't be able to see her. I couldn't see it from the road. The only way is from above. Nicole's father takes the tape of both psychic sessions to Detective Novak. The investigator is skeptical, but he's also reached a dead end. I am not so naive to think that uh, just because I don't have a sp this special ability doesn't mean it wasn't given to someone else. No leads came, nothing. And it's not like we, we sat on our hands. I thought, it doesn't hurt. Began checking all the areas that uh, would resemble areas described by the psychic. 
there was an old railroad bridge, area where there was tall cattails, area where there was marshy uh, land, ponds, lakes, became up negative. And then the detective remembers something else the psychic had said. Have they uh, tried a helicopter in, in those uh, particular areas? We're only three days into the investigation at this point, and I'm gonna ask for a helicopter. So I felt I was going to meet with the resistance. But the next day, Novak gets his helicopter. It's Thursday, June the 6th. One of the pilots asked why we're using the state police helicopter. And I said, well, we're following the leads of a psychic with respect to a missing person. I'm saying to myself, oh, please, God, please let us find something. Because if we don't, I am never going to live this down. Five minutes later, above a secluded marshy area, very similar to what the psychic visualized, they do spot something. The pilot asked what type of uh, vehicle we were looking for, and I explained to him it was a black Chevy we were looking for. At that point, he said, I think I have see something down in the weeds right along the uh, Raritan Bay, as the helicopter made several circles above it to find the landing spot where we could land the uh, helicopter, you could see that there was, in fact, someone inside the vehicle. But what they see from the air is not so easy to see on the ground. Well, it was necessary to land on the, the beach area because of the uh, tall cattails and uh, the debris, it was a landfill, maybe a mile square, just covered with the cattails. You couldn't see anything. We each went in different directions, and uh, as I approached this one curve, I, uh, I, was, I was surprised because suddenly I saw the car, maybe 25 feet from the curve. The psychic indicated that uh, you could be 25 feet from the car and not see it. The psychic had also said that he had a bad feeling about Nicole, that she was dead. Look in and I see the remains of what appeared to be a female. I noticed the position of her body. Car doors were locked. I radioed in the registration, confirmed that it was in fact Nicole's car. Once we opened the door of the vehicle, she didn't appear to be seated behind the driver's seat, that she happened to be more in the center of the vehicle between the driver's and the passenger side, that the vehicle was still in gear and the uh, ignition wasn't all the way on. Inside, police find a letter in Nicole's purse dated June 1st, the night she disappeared that appeared to be a semi-suicide note. Yet, there was no evidence that a suicide had occurred here. I remember being um, happy that they found her, but it was like I wanted to pass out and I couldn't. I was like halfway, but you know. My heart just ached for Pat and Jerry and Dylan. The autopsy finds the cause of death, acute morphine toxicity, a heroin overdose. The county prosecutor rules her death a suicide, but was it? It didn't make any sense to me that she would do that. It doesn't add up for the detectives either. First, there's Nicole's letter found in her purse. The ink on a date was a different color than the body of the letter. And I thought that uh, was strange. Her mother confirms that Nicole often recorded her feelings, however dark. Nothing that went through her mind wasn't written down somewhere. Because she was living a dangerous life, and in case something happened, she wanted to make sure that people knew things, especially Dylan. Then, the location of the car. And I kept in mind what Nicole's father had told me. She didn't like driving at night, and she would have had to drive over discarded railroad ties and uh, roofing material that was discarded in the area. There was no way that the Nicole drove herself to this particular location, especially at night. Somebody had to have driven her car there. And some of the things that really stood out were what wasn't there. No 
drug paraphernalia, there was no needles, no syringes, other than a ligature on the floor. And then Detective Novak remembers what the psychic said on the tape. Nicole was not alone when she died. There's at least two or three of them. They were there, they know what happened. There was more to this than a suicide. inside her car, abandoned in a secluded New Jersey marsh. It's ruled a suicide, but a psychic says others were involved, and the lead detective thinks so too. Anyone reading that letter could easily draw the uh, logical conclusion that this was a suicide. However, they didn't have the information that I had. Her boyfriend, on the first day of the investigation, referred to Nicole in the past tense. The position of her body, the fact that the call was locked. Most families, once a loved one commits suicide, kind of realize after looking back that the signs of suicide were there. They were depressed or they were having some type of problem. The parents were pretty insistent that they didn't believe that Nicole had taken her own life. And if she did, in fact, do that, then the crime scene would have been totally different. Usually when you die from a heroin overdose, the death is pretty instantaneous to the injection. There isn't time to remove the syringe from the vehicle, clean up the papers, dust off the dashboard, and, and make the car kind of neat. If you're gonna inject yourself, you probably would have the car in park. The vehicle had actually been left in gear. If she had been, say, trying to leave the scene and all of a sudden the overdose kicked in and killed her, then that vehicle would have run out of gas before the police found her. Yet once we put the vehicle in neutral and turned the key on, it started right up. The suicide note was folded up in her pocketbook. You would probably leave it out in the vehicle. So everything that seemed to be a suicide just didn't seem to be adding up. If she didn't commit suicide, how did she die? Novak suspects. Todd Connors, Eric Nordling, and her boyfriend, Mike Reed. Couldn't imagine why people I suspected would do such a thing to, to a friend. For the detectives, there seems to be only one answer. Under New Jersey law, if you cause someone's death by giving them a narcotic, it's technically a homicide. I brought in the uh, people involved, got nowhere. The case is officially closed, but for Nova, it's still open. Sometimes it's better to take a step back, let the people involved come to the belief that they got away with something, and they begin to talk and, and tell friends. Over the next three months, his strategy starts to pay off. Just as much as I was repulsed by what had happened to Nicole, the friends of uh, Eric, Todd, and Mike Reed were just as repulsed because we began getting information through informants uh, with respect to what is being said. Mike Reed shot up Nicole, and she OD'd, and he dumped her out in the landfill. That information wouldn't have been admissible in court because it's hearsay. To have any chance of charging Mike Reed, they need confessions from the people who were with Nicole when she died. They keep waiting. After the call was processed at police headquarters, it was parked outside for the longest period of time. And every time I left police headquarters, I would look over the, at the car and I would say, come on, Nicole, help me out here. I repeated that uh, probably a hundred times. For the next three months, the case eats away at the detective until one December night. I was serving warrants at a, an apartment complex totally unrelated to this, and I find this necklace. Uh, it was a child's necklace, uh, the name Nicole. Although it's not Nicole's necklace, the detective sees it as a sign. And I thought, this is Nicole's response to me. Maybe it's time that I bring these people in and talk to them again. But Mike Reed is in jail on an unrelated charge. So Novak brings in his friends, Eric Nordling, and Todd Connors. Eric was the first one to go in because we felt he was the weakest link. Sergeant Burns made Eric aware that he was familiar with uh, Eric's family. His family would be disappointed 
with the, what they had done with Nicole. At that point, Eric uh, tears up, and Eric began to tell. But Todd Connors admits to nothing. I just confronted him, I yelled at him. This is what you do to her? You leave her there and rot? And he just looked away. We knew he had him. But he said he, he, he didn't want to talk anymore. Novak needs statements from both Connors and Nordling in order to charge Mike Reed with Nicole's death. A few weeks later, he gets his chance. He brings Todd Connors in on a contempt of court warrant from a nearby town. But this time, he ups the ante. Novak brings in an investigator from the county prosecutor's office. She threatens to charge Connors with obstruction if he doesn't talk. It's Connors' last chance, and it works. Todd finally corroborates what Eric Nordling has already admitted, and what the psychic saw six months earlier, that Nicole was not alone when she died. According to their statements, around 8 p.m. on June 1st, 1996, Nicole, Todd, Eric, and Mike Reed head out to buy drugs. A half hour later in Perth Amboy, Nicole cashes her welfare check. At 9 p.m. in Newark, Mike Reed buys heroin. At a rest stop off the Garden State Parkway, Eric and Todd shoot up. Mike Reed shoots up Nicole. Todd and Eric fall asleep. When they come to, they're at the landfill, and Nicole is unconscious. Unable to revive her, they panic. But Mike Reed shows them the letter, the one the police initially took as a suicide note. He wipes down the car, removes all the evidence, and locks the doors. All three walk the two miles back to Todd Connor's house. She would have never done that to them. That's, that's what bothered me, never. Even if she had to be found guilty, she would have never done that. On December 16, 1996, Michael Reed is charged with the drug-induced death of Nicola Rokas. He pleads guilty and is sentenced to 10 years in prison. Todd Connors and Eric Nordling walk free. Obstruction charges against them are dropped in exchange for their statements. We had nothing. We found Nicole based on the information supplied to us by the psychic, Frank St. James. And that's it. It's just, I don't see how anyone could dispute it. I can't explain it, nor would I even attempt to. I would certainly not have a problem with talking to a psychic or talking to the devil himself if it would help us solve some of our unsolved crimes. I've done hundreds of cases. This was particularly gratifying, I guess, too, and sad at the same time, but I felt I, I helped the family at least. Nothing goes right forever. There's no closure, you never see them again. She didn't have a normal funeral, none of it was the same. Everything was messed up. 